Right, that concludes that particular section, and now it's over to you as the audience. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions or make comments. And I'll try and, uh, we've got about 20 minutes to do this until 10 to 9, I think. And then there'll be a uh, five minute summit, something after each of the speakers, so that we finish at 9 o'clock promptly. So, who has a question? Uh, you first, sir? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Uh, Thank you for the uh, methodology. Uh, I think the last debate, you provided the opportunity of the Islamic model of attaining peace, namely reaching people's hearts through love. Um, would you be willing to um, propose this New Testament um, love model uh, to your hometown, the Bronx, which is world famous for its crime rates? Well, uh, in defense of the Bronx, it's not as bad as uh, anyone, <laughs> <laughs> people here. Uh, I live in the Bronx, it's, uh, it's not all that bad a place. No, I wouldn't let my wife walk down some streets at, uh, at night alone. Uh, but as far as uh, the alternative, reaching uh, people with love, uh, again, the, the Christian view is that there are governments and that the, the governments do in, enforce laws. And generally, almost every government that's ever existed has had certain basic laws uh, in common. Uh, so, as far as reaching people with love, that's not, that's not really what I meant. Uh, I meant that how do you actually really change a society? You don't go in, conquer it, force everyone to submit to a certain view, because then people don't really agree with it. They don't even really believe what, what, they're, what they're doing. Whereas, whereas in Christianity, the goal is to change the society, and then society, if there's going to be governments or whatever, society within, who, are, who are now influenced uh, by good and just laws would then influence uh, the government. So, no, I'm not saying, I'm not saying hey, if, someone, if someone's going, if you're going around killing, I'm going to go and talk to them and say, uh, hey, you know, I love you, as if this is going to uh, solve the problem. No, we need everything. No, we, need the, we need the governments instituted by God. Uh, we, need, we need love as well. Um, but yes, if you go around forcing people to, to uh, submit when they don't really believe in something, uh, I, I don't think that's that's going to be so lasting. So this one's not holistic. No. Okay, gentlemen at the back, yes. All right, yeah, just uh, for a day here. Um, just, uh, I, I seem to get too paradigmatic for the kingdom is not this world concept. Uh, I, I seem to think that there is uh, uh, an idea that uh, Christ will come again and rule on this earth. And then there's uh, separation from the actual people who actually become the body of the church as another kingdom in itself. So I'm trying to um, understand, is that, is that a distinction between those kingdoms or, or what? Yes, the, they're, they're a good question. This, there is going to be a future kingdom of God. This is post-resurrection. Uh, this will not be the exact same world we're in now. There will be no more corruption. I mean, even corruption of the, of the physical realm. God is going to restore all things. And that will be... Uh, a kingdom, that would be a kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is right now. When Jesus left heaven to come to earth, where was he going? He wasn't going to Bethlehem, that's just a stopping place along the way. He wasn't even going to the cross, it was another stopping place along the way. According to the New Testament, Jesus will indwell believers in him. And so where was Jesus going? Jesus was going here. The kingdom of God is wherever Christians gather uh, in his name. The kingdom of God is right here. It's in China. It's in Japan. It's in South America. It's in the Middle East. That's the kingdom of God. So uh, as far as in the world now, there is a spiritual kingdom of God. And uh, this is a kingdom that, that we don't start fighting for. Not a kind of physical war. So any questions for Abdullah specifically? <laughs> uh, thank you, Abdullah, for clarifying some of the ways you understand um, Christian, Christian thinkers and how love can be integrated within sort of use of force in certain circumstances. I think I use force rather than violence because that has other sort of connotations. But I'd like to challenge your trichotomy where you say Christians divorced from politics, e.g. Mennonites, Quakers, Christians submitting to authority, and then Christians who use power were like a thinking leaders and so on. Because it seems to me that it's almost as if God only gets brought into the third category there. Um, I would say that people who are Mennonites and Quakers, I'm not one of them, quite a lot of them are prepared to go to prison because they believe God has said they should pay tax which goes to defence and so on. So it's not a case that they're retreating from the world, it's the case that they're being highly political, they're not being apolitical. And also the issue about people who fight um, in, in wars for their country, it's not the case that they're, I think there's a lack of definition here 
uh, possibly on both sides in terms of what it means about to fight for God. Certainly, I would not support, as David's been saying, about fighting for evangelistic purposes, um, fighting to establish a kingdom, but that's different to fighting, submitting to God, believing that God thinks that in, um, from Scripture that God is saying that this is a just war or whatever. And so therefore, you fight for the nation, but that's not excluding God. It's not as though you're fighting for a secular cause as opposed to a divine cause. Yeah. No, no, I would totally agree. Uh, there is no separation. I mean, I'll just certainly hear Martin Luther said in, the, in his uh, writing, The Soldier of His Conscience. This is why God honors the sword so highly that he says that he himself is the tutelated in Romans 13. In Romans 13, for the hand that wields this sword and killed with it is not man's hand, but God's. And it is not man, but God who hangs, tortures, beheads, kills, and fights. All these are God's works and judgments. So, um, all, the, but the only thing I'm trying to say here is, if we're trying to come off that uh, Shepherd is pacifist, it's not pacifist. I'm not attacking the Shepherd for not being pacifist. I mean, want to, I want him to come to this realization. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to argue for orthodoxy. I'm not arguing for Islam, I'm arguing for Christian orthodoxy here to come to this realization that Christianity is not pacifist, it gave the wars. My only contention is that the good intentions of Christians can be easily diverted in the wrong, wrong place because. There is not a clear understanding of what constitutes a just war. Can you fight for nationalism? If Tony Blair told you, or, or Gordon Brown told you to fight, or George Bush, or now Obama, which he is, or Afghanistan now, uh, is this a just, a just case? And the Christian soldier, and there are many evangelical Christians, you know, what do they do? You see? And those who are the the case is arguing, they've been arguing for pacifism, he's actually said in the last resort. So the lady there, most impatient. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to say that um, Paul was a violent man until he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And there's also many Christians abroad in violent places just helping the ordinary people and, um, and doing things for them, which is all very peaceful. I mean, um, I think it's a is it a comment or a comment? A comment. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Uh, hey, David. Uh, there are millions of evangelicals who appeal to the Bible to, to find support for the state of Israel. So I want to know if you agree with them. I just want to know, does the Bible condemn or support the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian land? Uh, I have to say, on generally, if I don't have a, a clear answer on something, I tend to remain agnostic and just say, I don't know. Um, is the war in Iraq just? I don't know. Should we support Israel? I believe in Israel's right to uh, right to exist and to defend itself. Uh, should I run over there and, and help them? I, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if, 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 I, if I don't know something, I'll be the first person to tell you I don't know. However, I, I, I should point out that uh, if uh, if Abdullah is right, and that when you when when a leader looks around the world and says, "Hey, if I see some injustice over there, somewhere else in the world, or I see oppression somewhere, I should run in and fight." I'd say if you hold that view, then you should run into Iraq and, and fight in Iraq, and you should run and fight the Palestinians because it becomes, "Hey, I see oppression, therefore I should go." So, given if I held to uh, his view to a greater extent, I would certainly say yes. Uh, but uh, I don't, and I'm, I'm not sure about. Uh, about, uh, about everything. Right. And Drew's going to respond to that as well. Then the is going to say something. The guy in the glasses. Then Gabriel. I'll never see him. He's in his time next. After that. And sure. then you. Sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, in this debate, it's meant, you know, two people come together and they're meant to, obviously, they're meant to persuade someone else to guide the person or guide them with the audience who are sincere and listen. But for the per person who has, who obviously came to the truth, has this Bible and so on, to guide him, he doesn't know a lot of things about the good and bad in this world that's happening and kills thousands of people who doesn't have no response to this. That's very worrying. You don't have a response to this? Thousands of people dying and you don't have to answer? Is this not guiding you enough? Because if it's not guiding you enough, then you know you, you really have some serious problems. And how can you say that uh, Christianity is a force of peace when you don't even know have a response to the massacres of many people and uh, thousands of people in this world? Okay. Um, David, my question's for you. Um, I just wanted to say that from what you told us, Christianity sounded very peaceful. And I just wanted to quickly illustrate the dilemma I find myself in. From what you've said, Christianity sounds very peaceful, but if I were to give you an analogy to try and help you understand how I think about this, if a group of people were to come in the future and say that 
well, we're very peaceful, we want an ideology of peace in the world, yet the Holocaust was justified and was necessary in order for this peace to come about, would you believe they were a peaceful people? Um, uh, yeah, was, was, the, was the Holocaust necessary? If they gave that analogy, I'm just saying. If they gave that particular example. Someone said they justified Holocaust. genocide, essentially. Um, I, I, ha I have to know the more details about the situation. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm coming up. I've got a question for David. Before that, I've got a public, uh, a general apology to make. For listening to uh, Abdullah, um, I became a Christian 18 years ago, and I'm not really teaching to the apostles and our parents. So I don't know, maybe I need to say, <laughs> think there's something deficient, or maybe I've done something wrong. But yes, that be it. See, I've got tremendous respect and, and appreciation for those who fought Hitler. And I always thought it was a just war. Can you, can you what, what's your opinion on a just war, if any? And how do you contrast it with Abdullah's as an Islamic concept of a just war? Because we might be thinking just war in a certain sense, and you might be thinking of just war in a different sense. How do you, how do you contrast that the general opinion of a just war with the Muslim opinion of a just war? Uh, yes, if, if I had been around in, uh, in the time of Hitler, if I had been uh, German, I am German, uh, but if I had an opportunity, I hope, I hope I would have fought him uh, if I had this opportunity. So yes, when there is uh, extreme justice, injustice in the world, uh, I do not disagree with Abdullah on this, that people must stand against it. Now, there are various ways to stand against it. Um, uh, there's a book called The White Rose about a group of young Christian students uh, who published pamphlets against what Hitler was doing and spread them, and they were all ultimately killed for uh, spreading information uh, about Hitler, calling for resistance against Hitler. So uh, as far as what a just war is, my, my view would not be much different from uh, Abdullah's as far as uh, governments uh, can and should fight uh, oppression. When oppression reaches a certain level, um, it might even be necessary for someone else to step in. Um, what, what I don't agree with is that this is done in the name of, of any particular religion to establish any particular ideology. It would be uh, for love of a, group, of a group of people. It's, uh, yes, it, it is done in love. Uh, we love those people here. Those people are going to be wiped out or slaughtered or, or horribly tortured, and we, uh, we need to protect certain people. So yes, it would, it would, anything that is a just war would have to be done out of love, but at the same time, it wouldn't be done out of hatred for the, uh, for the oppressive group who love them as well, even though they might need to, uh, might need to stop. Now the other next. I have a question for Abdullah. Um, David mentioned there, during the course of the debate that Christianity uh, is the religion off which uh, basic principles of government have been built. The concept of a state and the definition of a state is not found within the New Testament. Rather, the principles that transform someone individually are used by those people in conversation to determine how their government should be built. So it, it seems that uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear a good response to you, uh, from you about that. And in order to elicit that response, I'd ask you this very simple question. Is there any place in the New Testament where violence is enjoined upon people in general? OK. People in general. What do you mean, people in general? So as, as, a, as, as a tenant for people. Well, is there any place in the New Testament where violence is enjoined? Well, yeah. I said in 2 Peter 2.13, uh, where it says, that the ruler is going, is going to uh, uh, punish people, uh, the unrighteous, and so on. And again, Romans 13, which I keep uh, citing again and again and again, as uh, so that constantly, that the wrath of the ruler so the, the does not bear the sword in vain, but he is the wrath of God. You know, to punish the iniquitous. And of course, um, you know, there, there are many kind of, as I said, where it says in uh, the New Testament that. Uh, Everything can be used in the Old Testament as goods and wise teaching, and the New Testament, Old Testament has loads of uh, places where it gives you punishments. And of course, uh, Paul said in uh, I think it was Romans or I've got somewhere here, he said essentially that the the law is only for the unrighteous. If you're righteous, you're not going to break the law, so it's not going to be for you. But it's for the unrighteous who break the law. So there must be a law in place. Uh, and if you talk about the law, it must be the Old Testament law. You could argue that very strongly. 
And that should be in place only for the other righteous who break that law. So there is the violence which is mandated by the music. I'm not saying it makes Christianity bad and evil. I'm just saying that it does mandate violence. But not as on an individual level, but on a state level. Or as, a, as part of institutions and soldiers and so on and so forth. Okay? Yes. <laughs> David, I would like to ask you this comment and then I'll put the question again. You believe Jesus was crucified. Why God didn't have mercy in his own son and the will to own to be crucified himself and to be saved to save his own son? Oh, we are having a concept of no, God no, 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 on okay. Sunday or this Saturday. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Okay, what this to do with this? Is this violence? Violence on his son? Violence in the son committed? Violence in the son? Do you want to say this? This is my fault. My fault is not relevant. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Do you have, do you have yes. another question? Yes. Yes. Look here. In uh, Luke 19, 27, For these enemies of mine who did not went to me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them for me. That is Jesus. Now, watch what happened right here. In my yeah. opening statement, I said you always have to look at the context. Uh, Muslims constantly appeal to this verse. Jesus says, this is saying as Jesus, Jesus said, as for those enemies who didn't want me to rule over them, bring them here and slay them before me. You see there, Jesus is calling for people to slay. Now, start earlier in the same passage, Jesus, where it says Jesus told them a parable about a king who came to an area and people didn't want him to rule over them. So, uh, so he left, and they started up a rebellion against him. And then, when he returned, when he returned, he said, "Now for those, now for all those people who rebelled against me, bring them here." So this is a parable. It's about a king. It's about a king. Now, is this telling us something about Jesus? Yes. This passage is about Jesus. He's saying, "I'm going away now. All kinds of people are going to rebel against me, and when I come back." I'm going to judge them. So does this have anything with Jesus now telling us to, uh, to kill people in his name? Of course not. But when it's quoted on some websites and some books and so on, that's exactly how it appears. Jesus said, kill them. Okay, so. Uh, <coughs> sorry, just a little bit. You say that um, Christianity spread the fastest in the first three centuries because Christians were under oppression and uh, they, was, they, they took that and that's where it's going. But then you say that when, if you were under the Hitler regime and you saw that oppression, you would fight against it. I don't understand which way around you're working. Are you fighting against something or would you suffer the oppression? Because that would harm your cause for spreading Christianity if you were to stand up against Hitler. Um, no, there, well, no, good question, but there's, there's, there's a difference here. During the first three centuries of Christianity, um, when Christians were not fighting, this wasn't, you know, as far as number-wise, this wasn't the greatest period, but as far as uh, how Christianity, um, you know, specifically percentage-wise, for instance, millions of people become Christian every year in China, for instance, now. Um, but no, when these people were commanded to live peacefully, turn the other cheek, not return violence for violence, they were obedient to God, and it seems to me that God, that God blessed them later on. They said, no, we want to be like everyone else and fight like the Roman Empire and so on. And things have been disastrous for, for a long time afterwards. And it took the West uh, centuries and centuries to start breaking away from that way of doing things. Uh, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about someone like Hitler, this is not, hey, he's persecuting us and therefore we need to fight him. This is, he is oppressing, uh, he's oppressing this group right here and trying to annihilate everyone in that group. Uh, should we stand up against something like that? I would say uh, the answer is yes. And just to give you, you know, uh, uh, more, uh, more of an idea, if someone were to come to me, if, uh, if, if, uh, if an angry person after this debate were to come up to me and attack me, uh, do it. You can beat me into the ground. I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm not going to, to defend myself. If I saw someone uh, attacking this man or attacking this man, I'd, uh, I'd probably stop it. I'd do everything I can to stop it. I'd like to add a few points. Actually, I'm just, just to um, correct you, that, um, it's, the Christianity was spread fastest through the first few centuries. When it attains state power, Constantine, then it spread really fast. A lot of it was forced persecutions, unfortunately, and they believed they were doing the love of God by helping the heathens to come to salvation, uh, and they believed that coercion was necessary. And I, I, if, they, if I had time, I would have quoted um, uh, all four of the, the church fathers about how coercion, especially Thomas Aquinas, um, coercion can be used 
to uh, bring people to salvation. Uh, but again, it was after they attained state power to subscription. Okay, the very last question, we're running out of time, is Jennifer. Quick question for David. According to Luke 22, verse 26, um, this is just before Jesus had been confused with John, just only and um, praised to be saved from the death on the cross. Jesus commands the two of his disciples, his disciples to sell their belongings to purchase two swords, and one of those swords is then used against the entourage of the country to take Jesus to the cross. How do you reconcile that with your love, your enemy, and uh, peaceful, general peaceful message? Well, this is, this is another good question. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus tells his followers, uh, go buy some swords. And his disciples say, we have two. And he says, that's enough. So now, is Jesus planning an armed rebellion? Is he planning to go out and spread Christianity uh, with violence? Of course not. Two swords would not be enough for that. That's clearly not the meaning of what he said. And by the way, just a little later, when one of his followers decides to use one of these swords, he says, stop it. What the, what, what are you doing? Uh, so what does Jesus mean here? Well, I, I have to think that it's found right there in the passage when Jesus says that, uh, that he says, go by swords. Why? And he says, for it is written. He says it is written that he will be numbered among the transgressors for the Romans to come, I mean, for the, for, the, uh, for the authorities to come and lock him up. They need a justification, and that justification is that he is part of a group of rebels. And so it seems that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy here. I want you guys to have swords because it's written that I am to be numbered among a group of rebels. This is not, hey, we're going to go fight with them. It's when people show up, uh, they need their justification to go and uh, to go and kill them on the cross. So it's hmm. my thoughts. That's right. Well, thank that you. Last minute, it doesn't tell you what you are telling me. Sorry, sir. We're going to have to uh, wrap it up there. Thank you very much for your comments and your questions. Uh, I'd like to invite the speakers now to give their final five minute summary. And uh, we'll do it in the order that we started, which I'm going to invite David to begin. Thank you. All right, well, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of issues. I'll try and zoom through some of them for uh, some final comments. Uh, Villa says Christians desire peace, and he says that a Christian government would be according, uh, governed according to Old Testament uh, laws. No, a Christian government, if there, were, if there were going to be a Christian government, we have all sorts of principles, uh, to, uh, biblical principles on how, uh, how we would go about this. It would be uh, God loves everyone. And so every person is in the world is important. Uh, now, I'm a philosopher. I study, and by the way, I teach philosophical ethics, so I study, teach the ethical systems of various ages. Uh, go to someone like uh, Aristotle, the greatest ancient Greek uh, uh, ethics, a man of ethics. Uh, Aristotle or Plato or even Socrates. You never, you know what you never see? You never say, uh, hey, you should love everyone in the world. Uh, you should seek the good of everyone in the world. Uh, all people are created equal. If you were to tell Aristotle or any of the ancient Greek thinkers, all people are created equal, everyone's equal, and they would say, what in the name of common sense are you talking about? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. That would have been their response. They rail against these sorts of things. And you, it's not until you get to Christianity where you find, uh, well, you have this in the Old Testament where God says that he loves the alien. Uh, the aliens must not be harmed among the Jews because God has love for them. But then we have the full revelation when we get to Jesus Christ that God has a concern for everyone, that God wants us to live in peace with everyone. Um, and so, and, and by the way, Paul even says, he's talking to a slave and a slave owner, and he says, there is no partiality between you. God doesn't like one of you better than the other. Uh, so has Christianity influenced uh, governments? Has Christianity influenced the world for the better? Given the, the older ways of thinking, you have never had any of this. You have never had the idea that I should be worried about what's going on in Afghanistan. Or I should be worried about what happens in China. You would have never had this. Who cares? They're over there. But in Christianity, we have a concern for everyone. And this has spread all over the world. This has spread all over the world. So that's certainly a positive impact. It says, uh, Christians didn't fight in the beginning because we, are not, and we were in a minority. No. The numbers of Christians spread uh, very rapidly. They could have fought in certain areas. Again, they were in various areas of the world. They could have, they could have, started, uh, they could have started fighting. They didn't fight because they were commanded not to fight. They believed in the New Testament. They were told not to fight. Um, he said Christians didn't fight in the army because it required paganism. Uh, no, they just didn't want to fight. By the way, there were certain Christians in the army. They were told to, uh, to, to stay in the army. But they weren't out there fighting. Uh, this was a, this was, there was the separation. They were fighting uh, for the Roman government, but not for Christianity. It says feeding the enemies was commanded in the Old Testament. Good. We believe in the same God of the Old Testament. 
Uh, and he says it only means if you're in power. If you're in power over your enemy. No, Paul was never in power over any enemy. And he still said that we should feed our enemies. We are to show concern for them. He asked, why did I say that Islam is a religion of peace simply because it allows violence? Well, now I'm saying that Christianity allows violence, and yet I say it's still peaceful. Why the inconsistency? Well, there is no inconsistency. I never criticize Islam for allowing some violence. I, I think it's abundantly clear that I am not a pacifist. Uh, I criticize Islam for saying, kill the unbelievers, fight the unbelievers. Those who do not believe in Allah. That's why I criticize in Islam, and that is something that Christianity specifically condemns. He says most Christians go to their pastors for information. We have to turn to people of scholarship and learning, so why not turn to people like Aquinas and Augustine? I do believe you should turn to people like Aquinas and Augustine, uh, as long as what they're saying is consistent with the New Testament. Uh, so I don't have any problem with going to scholarship. Um, he says, I haven't shown that Aquinas or Augustine were incorrect. Well, I don't see many places where I'm in, where I'm in disagreement with them. Again, I've been constantly uh, represented tonight as a, as a pacifist, which just isn't my position. I'm saying that Christianity is not a state. It is not an earthly kingdom, and we are not to fight in its name. Uh, Christians who come to power believe in going biblical. Old Testament I've already uh, addressed that. Um, uh, he, he says that he, he said earlier that Aquinas appealed to natural law because the New Testament just doesn't give us laws. Absolute nonsense. Aquinas appealed to natural law because he was wondering why are there people all over the world who follow some of the same rules that we do? So there must be some sort of natural law that God made us so that we have some light as to how we are to live. So that any person in the world could recognize that he is a sinner, that he sinned against God, that he is in need of salvation. <clears throat> Um, he said that Christianity is not a force uh, of peace in the world. I mean, go to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Where did you get that idea? Go back to the New Testament. God loves everyone. God has created everyone. There is no partiality. It says this in the New Testament. Um, he says, I don't have enough uh, guidance from the Bible to know what I'm supposed to do in the world. So, David, you don't, you don't know what you're supposed to do with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or within Iraq. It's not that I don't know enough about the Bible. It's that I don't know enough about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or uh, what's going on in Iraq. Uh, sorry. Okay. That's it. Let me take up here as well. Abdullah, you have uh, five minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, well, the early church fathers, again, I'm going to mention a whole bunch of points and then surmise. The early church fathers did talk about our God being an issue uh, of why um, the, the restrictions to Christians in, in uh, joining the Roman army. Read Tertullian's book on, on idolatry, and that would answer your point. Um, lastly, was, he tried to throw a red herring on oh, the Quran says, fight the unbelievers. Oh, it's very interesting to quote that. I could just say, well, okay, Jesus says, uh, I think I'm, I'm not going to bring peace with the sword, and leave it like that. And just quote it out there. It means really, it sounds really bad. But again, uh, I advise you to perhaps look on our website, check the, the, the video where we're going to put it up on our last talk where he brought up again and we clarified for him what that meant and not just to drop red herrings. Secondly, um, my, my, my issue is governments can either be two things. It can either be secular law or Old, Old Testament law. Old Testament law is generally will cause uh, oppression if you separate it from the, the uh, inherent uh, halakha laws of the Jews. If you say, no, we don't follow it anymore, just have a basic, do not commit adultery, stone the adulterer. If someone Jesus said to the, uh, some of the Pharisees that why don't you, you know, uh, it, why do you not kill your, your son who is basically um, dishonored his father and mother in the Bible. So these things can cause oppression and that's why, that's one extreme. The other extreme is because uh, Christian, Christian governments, well not really Christian, they become secular, who use secularism and then their goal objects become materialistic. And then they will go around the world fighting for materialism, exploitation, and so on and so forth, which causes injustice again. So in either of those two paradigms, we have injustice and oppression. And that was my point that, um, with all due respect, I, I absolutely, I, I think all Christians have, uh, you know, well, most Christians, most practicing, and definitely most practicing Christians have very good intentions as well, very good intentions well. I have not seen otherwise from, from practicing Christians. But uh, the intention is not enough. There's no method to bring about oppression. I can simply uh, uh, disabuse him of, of his belief that um, you know, uh, Christianity cannot answer these issues by asking him what is oppression and give me a biblical understanding of it. What is, what is human nature? Give me a biblical understanding of it. How do you judge oppression? Where is, how is this judgment of oppression by a state? Uh, is, it, uh, is it capitalism? Is it capitalism oppressive the system? Is it communism or Nazism? One can say communism is a law of love. Love the poor. Isn't it? Love the poor. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, that's very communist. 
<laughs> very common thing. Um, not, you could even argue, even really crazily, that Nazism is love of Germans, love of the German nation and background. You see, every, all injustice happens from love, but it's what you love. And how you regulate that love. Maybe you can love someone so much, you, you can say you love your wife too much, that you, uh, you, you deny yourself your own rights, or, or, or vice versa. You know, a, a woman can be too obedient to her husband that she you know, denies herself her rights. That's love gone astray, too much, because of OTT. Just say, the law of love, it sounds great during the 70s, but it has no methodology. Um, I think, uh, I want to say that, may, I think maybe we should see by what Jesus said. Yes, well, uh, what Jesus said is that I, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to, or in Greek, to render it perfect, or to uh, render it to be uh, perfected or complete. Jesus did not want to abolish the law. And I think that is because of this going astray from the law that Christians don't know what to do now. What do we do? Is it, well, I don't know, uh, 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 how do we organize this? Or do we just use some morals in the Old Testament and, in, in, and uh, use what God's punishment in the most severe sense the Old Testament does? Or is it more nuanced than that? Again, maybe to speak to your local friendly neighborhood Jew, give you some advice, but I think that uh, it's just having the law of love is very great, but as this famous saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So good intentions is not enough. So I'm just saying that we desire peace is not enough. I think I've said most things though, but I can say a couple of things. Now, to be very quick, David uh, uh, sometimes distorts or uh, misaligns my religion. He says that we don't become exempt with, with, uh, with non-believers. I can say 2 Corinthians 6.14 does the same, but I'm not going to because I'm not going to use his methodology. He says that we're allowed to lie. Um, I could say that 1 Corinthians 9, where, where um, uh, Paul said there are more things to all men, where St. John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, funny enough, says uh, that great is the force of the seat, and finally does not excite excited by treacherous intention. So you can lie as long as you don't have a bad intention. I use the same thing, but I'm not going to, because it's bad scholarship. It's just nitpicking and trying to find things against other person, mudslinging. It's not the real truth. And I, like, I wish you had the same approach to me as I did for Christianity. I argue for orthodoxy. So, my last message is, I believe that all you, you good Christians here, and obviously you Muslims here, we all desire peace, and peace is great, and may our hearts you know, unite together, and so on, but we need a methodology, and that's why I say Islam brings peace, and Christianity, unfortunately, needs to find a way, a method, by which it can bring peace, other than waiting for Jesus to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. For this long evening with us, it's been a fascinating discussion. I hope, I hope we've all gained some benefit in terms of knowledge and understanding.